Hey, Memorial Heights, it's Pastor DJ. Are we living in the time that Jesus called the beginning of sorrows? Is COVID-19 a sign of the times? Those are a couple of questions I want to consider with you tonight. But first, we're in the middle of Passion Week, and I want to give you a personal invitation to be part of our Good Friday service at 7 o'clock and our Easter morning Resurrection Sunday service at 11 a.m. These are times that we as a church, even though we're separated, we can come together online here on Facebook and we can remember what Jesus Christ has done for us, the sacrifice that he made and the victory that he achieved. You know, Jesus Christ, uh, in obedience to God the Father, he came to earth, he lived the sinless life that you and I cannot live. He died on the cross in payment for our sins and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He completely and fully satisfied the wrath of God. Uh, 1 John 2 says that Jesus Christ died not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. He took the whole of mankind's sin debt on himself, satisfied the wrath of God, and as proof that the Father was satisfied with his sacrifice, he rose again the third day. According to the scriptures, he offers us forgiveness of sin, eternal life, simply by grace to be received by faith. And so for those of us who have called upon the name of the Lord, as Romans 10 says, we've been forgiven. We have been given eternal life. We are born again. And we need to come together and we need to celebrate that. We need to, even in, in this time, and especially in times of trial and times of crisis, we need to thank the Lord for what he has done in us and for us for all eternity. Now, if you don't have that hope, if this time of crisis is, is um, driving you to, to search for answers, you, you've never admitted your sin. You've never trusted in Christ as your Savior. Uh, I want to extend that invitation to you right now that all you need to do to be born again and to receive forgiveness and to receive eternal life is to confess your sin to the Father, to tr place your trust, fully believe that Jesus Christ is who he said he is, that he did die for your sin, that he did rise again from the dead, and that he did pay your sin debt, and that you can be forgiven simply by calling upon the name of the Lord, simply by asking for that forgiveness and receiving God's grace by faith. And when you make that decision, you will be forgiven. You will be given eternal life. You will be born again. Now, if you've made that decision and uh, you watch one of our videos and you've made a decision to follow Christ, we would love to hear about it. We'd love to talk to you. If you're not sure if you've made that decision or if you have questions, we would love to talk with you. One of the pastors here, either myself or Pastor Chan or Pastor Nick, we would love to get back in touch with you. So please leave us a message here or uh, call the office. Even though it's closed, you can leave a message. We'd, we'd love to get back in touch with you and tell you more about the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Now, for those of us who have made that decision, who aren't part of this church or, or the church, uh, I want to spend a few minutes talking about what Jesus was talking about just a few days before his crucifixion. Have you ever wondered what was on Jesus' heart, what was in his mind as he was getting ready to go to the cross? Well, we don't have to wonder because uh, the, a lot of those questions are answered for us in the Gospels. In fact, this period of Jesus' life is given more coverage than any other period in the Gospels. In, in particular, the Gospel of John spends a lot of time talking about the last night and the hours leading up to the crucifixion. But this week is covered in great detail in uh, all four of the Gospels. And we're going to look very briefly at one message that Jesus gave initially to four of his disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And it's called the Olivet Discourse. It's about the future. And it has a lot to say to us today. Now, we're going to pick up the story in Matthew chapter 24. Jesus has been, this is the Passion Week, Jesus has been coming into the city, he's been teaching in the temple, and then he withdraws from the city at night. And so Jesus has just spent all day in the temple preaching very prophetically. He's preached uh, prophetically in the sense that he's been condemning the hypocrisy of the religious leaders and exposing the uh, wickedness uh, that was behind their uh, self-righteousness. And he's also been talking about the future, sometimes in parables like the parable of the vineyard. And sometimes he's been talking about the future in, in answer to other questions or in dealing with other things. He, he talks about the resurrection of the dead to the Sadducees. And he talks about the fact that he is the Lord of David and yet the descendant of David. And he references the prophecy that he is going to uh, be placed on the throne by his heavenly father. And he's gonna, uh, the heavenly father is going to make all of his enemies, Jesus' enemies, uh, into his footstool. And he's talking about the future and he says uh, one prophecy very uh, dear to and near and dear to the disciples' heart at the beginning of chapter 4. And they're going to come back and they're going to ask him 
about what is going on and why all of this confusing information and, and this confusing data that they're getting. So let's pick it up in Matthew chapter 24. And let's read the first uh, few verses together. It says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now, one of the reasons that the Olivet Discourse is such a, a confusing passage of Scripture, and really passages of Scripture, we see it here in Matthew 24 and 25. It's a shorter version, is also recorded in Mark 13, and another shorter, shortened version, although with some different points of emphasis, is found in Luke chapter 21. And one of the reasons this is such a challenging passage of Scripture is that Jesus is being asked questions about different events in history. One of those events is only about 40 years uh, away. And uh, other events are many thousands of years, or several thousands of years in the future. So Jesus is covering a lot of things, and he's covering them all at the same time. You say, well, why would Jesus do that? Why wouldn't he just be more clear about what is uh, in reference to the 40 years and what is in reference to the distant future? Well, one reason that he doesn't uh, differentiate very clearly is because a lot of the signs of the destruction of the temple, which is going to happen 40 years later in AD 70, are also signs that are going to uh, show up at the end of time, and they're also going to uh, foreshadow the events of the future. And so they're the same sign or almost identical signs for both events. And so Jesus covers them uh, at the same time. Now, we don't have time tonight to do a deep dive into the Olivet Discourse. We're just going to look very briefly at the very first part. But let me just tell you once, uh, right at the outset, that... I believe what Jesus describes here in these next few verses, what he calls the beginning of sorrows, I believe he is describing the time that we're living in right now. Now, there are many great Bible teachers, there are many great prophecy teachers who would say, no, these verses, they only apply to tribulation saints. All of this has to do with the tribulation. This isn't at all for us today. But I'm going to give you five reasons that I believe these are for us today, and these verses do apply to us, and that we are living in the beginning of sorrows, and that COVID-19 is a sign of the times that we're living in. Now, let's look closer at what Jesus says here. Verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences, like... COVID-19, a global pandemic, pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse or various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Now that phrase, beginning of sorrows, literally means the beginning of the birth pangs. We'll come back to that in a minute. But I believe, five reasons I believe, we are living at the beginning of the birth pangs. Now, here are the five reasons. Number one, all these signs are happening now. All of these things are happening now, and really they've been happening for about 100 years. We could go back to World War I, and we could see uh, global warfare uh, on a scale that had not taken place from the time this was made until then. So these things are happening right now. Now, when we talk about prophecy, remember what Peter says that, uh, in Moses, the day, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So when we talk about prophecy, and we talk about big periods of time from our perspective, um, we need to remember that from the eternal perspective, it's not really that long of a period of time. So when we talk about decades or even a century as being the beginning of something, we're not talking about um, uh, really that big of a deal because again, a day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. Time is from a different perspective when you're looking at things uh, from an eternal perspective. And that leads me to the second reason I believe that, that we are living in this time period. Here's the second reason. There's a difference between the beginning of sorrows or the beginning of labor pains, what we call contractions, and the pain of delivery itself. 
Now, many who would say that these verses apply only to the tribulation would point to passages like Jeremiah chapter 30 and 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, where we're told that the day of the Lord or the tribulation period is like labor pain. It's described as labor pain. And absolutely, when you hit the tribulation, when you are in the day of the Lord, you're talking about labor pain. But please understand that there is a difference between the beginning of labor, the contractions that begin labor, and the labor pain itself. Now, of course, I speak as a man. Okay, I'm not claiming any personal experience here. I only have eyewitness experience. I was in the delivery room with Gigi whenever Elijah was born. What an amazing uh, time period that was. Uh, but I was there and I saw firsthand the contractions begin. I saw them begin in, to increase in intensity, increase in frequency. And then when you get right up to the birth, then you are uh, in full-blown labor pain. But there is a difference. You know, some women experience uh, false labor, what's called Braxton Hicks, as early as the second trimester. And things can begin many weeks, even months ahead of the actual uh, delivery of the child. The, the contractions, the labor pains can begin very early for some women. And so the fact that something is called the beginning of sorrow does not automatically equate it with the actual event of delivery itself. Here Jesus is very clearly distinguishes the beginning of sorrows, not labor pain itself. And that brings me to another prophecy as we get into this third reason that I believe this is the period of time we're living in. And I want you to keep a finger in Matthew or keep a piece of paper in Matthew 24. Turn back with me to Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66 is an oft forgotten prophecy as it relates to birth pains, but I believe it is incredibly relevant for what we're talking about tonight. Now, let me set the stage. Isaiah 66 deals with the second coming, and it deals with the establishment of the new heavens and the new earth. We know that because he actually uses the phrase, God uses the phrase in this passage, new heavens and new earth, and he talks very clearly about the uh, second coming and return of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to take the time to read this entire passage of scripture. Uh, I would encourage you to read it to don't assume and, or take my word for what I'm saying. Go ahead and read it for yourself. But let's just pick it up in verse 5, and let's see what he says about birth pangs as it relates to prophecy. So Isaiah 66, verse 5, again, this is ultimately dealing about with the second coming and the establishment of the new heavens and new earth. But he says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word, your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. This is the same thing that Jesus was talking about to the disciples, that people were going to persecute them, people were going to put them to death, and they were going to think that they're serving God in doing so, but actually they are the ones, the martyrs are the ones who are doing God's will, not the ones who are doing the killing. If uh, you're into the killing, that is not of God, Okay. God is going to be the one who brings vengeance himself. He doesn't want us to do his killing for him. Now is the time of grace. Now is the time of mercy. Now is the time of salvation. It's the time we are here as ambassadors. We're not here as God's, um, as God's hitmen, okay? But these people think that they're doing God's work by killing God's servants. So let's look at verse 6. A voice of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, a voice of the Lord that rendeth, uh, rendereth recompense to his enemies... And notice this, verse 7, Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to birth and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord? Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, saith thy God? Rejoice ye with Jerusalem, be glad with her, all ye that love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all ye that mourn for her. Now we'll stop there, but just skip down to verse 15 real quick, and, and so that you can see that this is about the second coming. Verse 15 says, For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariot like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his re her rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Verse 22 talks about the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. Now, Notice what these verses say related to prophecy as it relates to childbirth and as it relates to labor pain. There are two births that Isaiah 66 predicts, two births that are prophesied. The first takes place before 
the birth pangs. Before the woman is in, is in travail, this birth takes place. This birth is the birth of the man-child. Now, who is the man-child? Well, if we look in context, the only man who shows up in this passage is the Lord himself. And indeed, that is exactly what Revelation chapter 12 tells us, comparing Scripture with Scripture. That the woman gives birth to the male child, and the male child is clearly in Revelation 12 speaking of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So, the Messiah will be born before the birth pangs. That's, what, that's all this says, but it is an incredible prophecy, and it is a prophecy that's come, that has come to fulfillment. But notice the second birth. The second birth doesn't take place before the contractions, before the childbirth, nor does it take place at the end during the labor. The second birth takes place after the birth pangs begin. Notice what that birth is. Verse 8, Who hath heard such a thing, who hath seen such things, shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. After the birth pangs begin, Isaiah 66 says, the nation of Israel will be reborn. The nation will be born. Zion will bring forth her children in a day, and God will use the nations of the earth to make it happen. Guys, that's exactly what God did in 1948. In the, in the a single day, God used the nations of the world to give birth. God did it, but he used the nations to give birth in fulfillment of prophecy in a single day to the nation of Israel. Now notice that happened after the beginning of travail, after the, after the contractions began. So, were there anything, was there any event, or were there any things that were happening, anything happening before 1948, before the birth of Israel, that we could call wars and rumors of wars, that we could call famine, that we could call pestilence, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, anything happening? Well, if we just look at a few years, we're in World War II, we're in the Holocaust. If we go back just a few decades, and again, prophecy is, um, uh, takes place over a much longer time than we would think, because our period of time, our perception of time is things are very long. God's perception, of times, God's perception of time is that things happen very quickly. If we go back just a few decades, now we're into World War II, and we had to skip over the Spanish flu to get there. It's been said that World War I prepared the land of Israel for the people. And that World War II, God used to prepare the people of Israel for the land. That's exactly what happened. The birth pangs began. The nation was born in a day. But notice the birth pangs haven't ended yet. Because the Lord hasn't returned in his chariot of fire yet. God hasn't set up the new heavens and the new earth yet. See, I believe, the third reason I believe we're living in the birth pangs today is because of the birth of the nation of Israel. Have we ever asked and stopped to consider what is being born? Who is being born? The birth pangs are not the birth of judgment. The birth pangs are the judgment. But what is the judgment giving birth to? Ultimately, the judgment is giving birth to the new Jerusalem, which will be ruled over in the second coming by Jesus Christ himself, who will reign unopposed for a thousand years. There will be one brief uprising revelation talks about at the end of that thousand year period but the kingdom of god is going to continue into the new heavens and the new earth and the kingdom of christ will reign he will reign forever and ever and ever and ever that is what is being born but it begins with the birth of the king before the birth pangs and after the birth pangs begin the nation will be born in a single day. That's exactly what God did in 1948. I believe the birth of the nation of Israel is evidence that we are living in the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of the birth pains. We're not in full labor yet. We're not, we haven't hit the day of the Lord yet. We're not in the tribulation yet. But we are living in this time period described by Jesus. Now, let me give you two other reasons very quickly on why I believe we're in the, um, the time that Jesus describes as the beginning of of sorrows. And I want you to go with me to um, Luke chapter 21. We don't have time to talk about the fig tree prophecy, although that is uh, another reason we, if we were talking about the birth of the nation of Israel. We, we can talk more about that at some other point, Lord willing. But let's look at these last two reasons I believe we are in the beginning of sorrows. Uh, reason number four is the promise of hope. 
the promise of comfort, the promise that we do not need to be troubled. I told you to turn to Luke 21. I wanted to first look at Matthew chapter 24 again. So let me just real quickly read Matthew 24, verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. See that ye be not troubled. This promise of not being troubled when we talk about God's judgment is very often in the scriptures connected with the rapture of the church. Now, if you're in Luke chapter 21, look at verse 28 of Luke 21. When these things begin to come to pass, when they begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Again, this is the same sermon. It's just some different points that Luke is bringing out. It's, it's the same all of a discourse different points. Look down at verse 36. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. The promise of escape. There is no promise of escape for those who are in the day of the Lord. There is no promise for tribulation saints of escape. There is no promise of comfort. In fact, if you were to go to Revelation chapter 6, and you were to look at the opening of the seals, Jesus Christ, who alone is worthy to open the seals of judgment. The fifth seal, after the four horsemen are unleashed on the earth, the fifth seal is the seal of the martyrs. And we're told that the souls of the martyrs, even in death and even in heaven, are crying out to the Lord, how long? How long until you avenge us? Even in heaven, the souls of the tribulation saints will have no comfort until the end. See, there is no hope for comfort. There is no hope for peace for those who wait. Now, there's hope of heaven. You can still be, there are people who will be saved after the rapture, but they'll be martyred and they won't have the same peace that we have. But those of us who are living on this side of the tribulation and on this side of the rapture, we have the promise of hope. John chapter 14, let not your heart be troubled, Jesus said. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where you may be, there I am. Where I am, there you may be also. First Thessalonians 4, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. We who are alive and remain will be caught up together in clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord's. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Chapter 5 says, we are not appointed unto wrath. The promise for the believer today is a promise of comfort and hope in the face of judgment. God's judgment on the earth. Ours is the hope of deliverance. It's the promise to the church of Philadelphia in Revelation chapter 3 that they will be taken out of the hour of trial that's coming upon the whole earth. Second Peter chapter 2 says the sign of Lot is that God knows how to deliver the righteous from trials and, and deliver them before judgment falls. God knows how to deliver his people uh, from the judgment that's going to come on everyone else. And so when we see and read about this promise in the all of the discourse, that when we see the beginning of sorrows, that we need not be troubled, to me that is a, a clear connection to the rapture generation and to the people who are living and still living with the hope of the rapture. We may not be the rapture generation, but we have the hope of the rapture. We have the anticipation. I believe we're going to be a part of that generation, but others have thought that and, and been wrong. But we still are living on this side of the rapture with the hope of the rapture. That's the hope that the people living through the beginning of sorrows have as well. And that brings me to the fifth and the final reason that I believe uh, that we are living in this period. And that's the command of verse 36 of Luke 21. The command to watch and to pray. To watch and to pray. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, we don't make ourselves worthy. When we trust in by faith in Jesus Christ, we are accounted his righteousness, we're credited righteousness, we're considered worthy to escape. But we who are considered worthy, we need to be living, watching, and praying. Now, let me ask you a question. If all of the Olivet Discourse is for the tribulation saint and none of it applies to us, then what are we to be watching for? How are we, why are we given this command to watch and to pray if there's nothing for us to watch for? You know, Hebrews chapter 10 says that uh, as we... Uh, make sure that we continue to meet together and that's why we're meeting digitally. We don't want to forsake assembling. The fact that we're staying separated for uh, health reasons and health precautions is, is in no way forsaking the assemblings of ourselves together. But the reason that we continue to do that and we're to do it all the more as we see the day approaching 
is because Hebrews 10 says that we will be able to see the day approaching. So there are signs. I believe the signs that are given to us are the ones here at the beginning of this all of the discourse. I believe we are the generation, a part of the generation that is living through the beginning of birth pangs. Thank God we won't be here for the full-blown labor of it. But these signs are for us. What are we what are we to do? We're to watch, we're to pray. And other passages of scripture will tell us we are the light of the world. We're to witness. We're to help others find the escape that's only available through Jesus Christ. We love you. We're praying for you. Your pastors are praying for you. Your deacons are praying for, praying for you. If you have a need, please let us know. Please contact, contact us here on Facebook or through our personal phones or uh, call the church if you, if you don't have those. We would love to pray with you, pray for you. We're going to get through this. Uh, and we're going to be trusting the Lord as we do. God's going to do a great work in us as we go through this. Uh, and we may not see all the fruit of that till we get to heaven. But hang in there, guys. This is a great time of the year to celebrate what we do have to be thankful for, the gift of Jesus Christ and the salvation he brings. We love you. God bless.